today's session of the Wednesday afternoon lecture series here at the NIH. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Anirban Banerjee. I'm head of the section of Structural and Chemical Biology of Membrane Proteins in the Intramural Program of NICHD. Um, today's talk is hosted by the Structural Biology Interest Group, of which I'm one of the coordinators. And it's a real privilege and honor for me to introduce today's speaker, Professor John Kurian, who comes to us from the University of California at Berkeley, where he's the Chancellor's Professor in the Departments of Molecular and Cell Biology and the Departments of Chemistry, as well as a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. John was born and raised in India and received his undergraduate degree in chemistry from Juniata College in Pennsylvania. And then he went to the Department of Chemistry at Harvard, where he got his PhD in uh, physical chemistry, uh, followed by a very short postdoctoral position uh, where he was working with Martin Karplus and Greg Petsko. Um, John's thesis research was mostly computational chemistry. For those of you uh, who are CNS users, you may remember uh, the refinement of R factor uh, by MD simulations was uh, a Brunger, Kurian, and Karplus paper. Um, so when he started his lab at the Rockefeller University and made the switch to experimental structural biology, it was a drastic and bold move. Um, and to John's credit, not only did he survive the transition as well as anyone could have imagined, uh, but research in his lab uh, have thrived, or has thrived along two very distinct directions. Uh, chemistry of DNA replication and signal transduction by protein kinases. John rose to the ranks at Rockefeller and became the Patrick E. and Beatrice M. Haggerty Professor. In 2001, um, John moved to UC Berkeley, where he has uh, remained since then. John's honors and accolades have been many. He is a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. He has received many awards, including the, including the prestigious Stein and Moore Award from the Protein Society, the Mark Award from the American Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and the Richard Lounsbury Award from the National Academy of Sciences, and many others that I don't have time to name here. Um, however, another significant mark of an academic scientist uh, is the scientist uh, that they train. And uh, John has trained an outstanding group of scientists who have gone on to become leaders in their own right. For those watching remotely, we encourage you, you can participate in the Q&A after today's presentation. You can do so by clicking on the button just below your video cast window that says send live feedback. Click on that, type in your name and question, and we will relay this question to Dr. Kurian uh, at the end of the lecture. You can uh, also submit a question anytime um, and don't have to wait till the end. Uh, for those of you in the room today, please use the mics on either side. Also, we are offering continuing medical education credits for this presentation. The CME code for today is 37946. I'll repeat that, 37946. The title of John's talk is Deep Mutagenesis Analysis of Evolv Evolvability in a DNA Polymerase AAA Plus Clamp Loader System. John, welcome to the NIH. Thanks for inviting, uh, accepting our invitation. Thank you very much uh, for the privilege of uh, speaking to you this afternoon in this hybrid format. But it's nice to see people alive and well in the audience, because if you can make eye contact with one or two, it lets you know that you're not speaking into the void, as we who teach undergraduates did for so many weeks over the pandemic. So I'm going to talk to you today about some work we've been doing to understand the ability of a molecular machine known as the DNA polymerase clamp loader to tolerate mutational uh, insults while it's functioning in the uh, DNA replication system. So uh, D all DNA polymerase uh, systems that replicate chromosomes achieve very great, great speed and processivity through attachment to a sliding clamp. And the sliding clamp is a circular protein that goes around DNA. And by attaching the polymerase to the sliding clamp, the system can achieve very high speed without letting go of DNA. So this is a principle that emerged. The structural basis for this emerged from studies done over the years uh, by my lab and the lab of Michael O'Donnell. And this simplified diagram essentially shows you 
how the DNA polymerase clamp loader system works to load sliding clamps onto DNA, and it does this repeatedly for every Okazaki fa fragment that's generated. So the DNA polymerase sliding clamp shown here is a complex of five different proteins labeled A, B, C, D, E. And uh, they are ATPase, they bind AT they're ATPases of the AAA plus family, and they bind ATP, and the action of the molecular machine is based on the ability to hydrolyze ATP. I'm going to be telling you today about one specific clamp loader called the uh, T4 phage clamp loader system. And in that particular one, there are two genes uh, that encode the five protein complex. One gene encodes the, the protein colored green here, which uh, is actually a degenerate AAA plus protein. So it doesn't look like the others, but it originated long ago from the others. And the other gene encodes four of the ATPases, which are labeled B, C, D, and E in this complex. And so together they form an assembly that does not hydrolyze ATP until it recognizes the sliding clamp, which is called PCNA in eukaryotes, and it recognizes a primer template junction, which is shown schematically here. And when those two things are recognized, the assembly hydrolyzes ATP, which releases the clamp loader from the sliding clamp and DNA, leaving the sliding clamp on DNA. So that's the uh, essential uh, function of a clamp loader. And the structures of these that we've determined have told us many of the essential um, aspects of uh, how these things are put together and how they work. But today, I want to focus on two questions that came out of things that we were wondering about. The first question is, we know that the diversity of AAA plus proteins, clamp loaders specifically, AAA plus proteins in general, is enormous, both in sequence and in structural details. And like all biologists who study molecular systems and even macroscopic systems, we wonder, how does nature come up with this diversity in structure while maintaining an essential mechanism? So one way to ask that is to ask the question, what's the capacity of the clamp loader system, or for that matter, any complex molecular machine, to accept changes to its sequence while it's actually performing a critical task, in this case, DNA replication? So what I'm going to tell you is about a system developed by Subhu Subramaniam in my lab, which allows us to probe the mutational tolerance of the system while it's actually replicating DNA. And the second question we'd like to ask and answer is what does the mutational response of the system tell us about the mechanism? Now we know a lot about the mechanism from the structural work and the biochemistry that we've done, but as you'll see, the analysis of the mutational response did teach us some completely unexpected things about the system. So that's what this lecture is going to be about. So the way the experiments were carried out was to use an experimental platform developed by Subhu Subramaniam, which is really extremely robust in terms of being able to tell us the effect on fitness of any mutation made in the clamp loader system. So first I'd like to just explain what this platform is using this diagram, and then I'd like to show you some data which convinced us that the system is actually really robust in terms of telling us the relationship between sequence and the function of the protein. So as I mentioned, the system we're using as a model system is T4 bacteriophage, which is special because T4 bacteriophage brings with it its own DNA replication proteins when it infects E. coli. So it brings a DNA polymerase, a sliding clamp, a clamp loader, a DNA ligase, a helicase, a single-stranded DNA binding protein all of which it uses instead of using the E. coli proteins. In addition, the, and this is not really important for the work I'm going to tell you about today, but in addition, these proteins that the T4 system brings with it are more similar to the eukaryotic replication proteins. They're actually a much better model for eukaryotic replication proteins than is the uh, bacterial system. Uh, so what Subu did was to engineer the T4 bacteriophage so that the specific replication proteins of interest, it could be any of the replication proteins, but today I'm going to talk about the sliding clamp and the clamp loader, are deleted from the T4 bacteriophage. So these bacteriophage here shown in gray 
don't have the replication proteins, the sliding clamp, the clamp loader. So they can infect E. coli, but they're unable to replicate. However, if the E. coli contain plasmids, shown here as these colored circles, that contain coding regions for these replication proteins, then the E. coli will make the, the proteins, and those proteins can be used by the T4 to, uh, to carry out DNA replication. And so if the E. coli contains a library, that is a, a variety of variants of these replication proteins, then ones that work better will produce more phage than ones that don't work so well. But there's one more thing that had to be done in order to set up a system where we could use Illumina deep sequencing to actually count the success of any variant. And that was to engineer into the T4 bacteriophage a CRISPR system, specifically CRISPR-Cas12, which is working in reverse. So you'll know that normally the CRISPR is, is pulling out uh, uh, DNA from the uh, bacteriophage and testing it. That's the classical mechanism of protection that the CRISPR system uh, employs. But here what the CRISPR is being used is to put the gene. So when a phage infects a particular E. coli, the CRISPR system will immediately put these genes back into the phage through CRISPR recombination. And so if these genes are actually successful at producing bacteriophage, then the bacteriophage will lyse the E. coli and the, and the better the replication proteins are in that particular E. coli, the more of that variant will be produced in solution. And so then the experiment is conceptually very simple. You use Illumina deep sequencing to sequence the population of the phage. You can use Illumina deep sequencing or any deep sequencing method to sequence uh, the library that went into the experiment, thousands of different variants in the pot. And then you can basically normalize the data to tell you which variants work better than the others. And you can actually then take up these phage, if you wish, and use them to reinfect E. coli and set up a competition. In that case, you'd be doing a natural evolution uh, variation of this, of this experiment. And so the essential idea behind this platform uh, was published in uh, 2021, the, towards, I forget when exactly it was published, but it's in the literature, so you can read about it if you're interested. But it really does provide us with a very accurate uh, uh, measurement of the fitness of a variant, accurate in terms of what we know about chemistry and biochemistry, and accurate in terms of uh, reproducibility and biochemical validation. And so to give you a sense, of the robustness of the platform, but also to explain um, the importance of a motif in the clamp loader that will become central to some of the experiments I'm going to end this lecture with. I want to introduce you first to a motif in these, in these uh, ATPases called the DEXD motif. Now, anybody who's familiar with RNA helicases will know about the dead box helicases. They were discovered maybe in the late 80s. They're a group of RNA helicases, very, very important in different aspects of biology, that have at the heart of the ATPase protein a motif DEAD, hence dead box. This particular ATPase, the T4 bacteriophage clamp loader, has DE phenylalanine, so I write that as X, D. So it's a, it's a dead box helicase with phenylalanine instead of alanine. Now, in this structural diagram, what you see is where the dead box is located. The D and the E of the dead box, these are all colored red here, the D and the E of the dead box are also called the Walker A motif because John Walker identified the importance of this on the F1 ATPA system that makes ATP. So these, are, these residues are ancient evolutionarily and they're crucially important. They're in the machine that makes ATP. They're in the RNA helicases that start off all kinds of processing and after transcription. What the D and the E do is that they coordinate a magnesium ion, shown here in green below the ATP, shown here in colors, and activate a water molecule, which is not shown here. So they're catalytically crucial residues, and they're always found in this family of ATPases. The third aspartic acid, the third acidic residue, the D, is not a catalytic residue. And what you see it doing here is it's coordinating an arginine, which you see in yellow and blue. And that arginine, which is labeled arginine 122, is presented by a neighboring subunit, not this one. So it's important for interfacial uh, 
coupling. So that's an introduction to the dead box motif. And what I want to show you here are a few things. First, let's look at the lower left. In the lower left is um, a sequence logo. And the way the sequence logo is generated by Subu was to align 1,000 phage genomes. So these are all bacteriophage genomes, of which T4 is one. And it shows you the conservation of residues in this segment across 1,000 phages. So it's actually a pretty restricted library. It isn't looking at the broader family of ATPases. And you'll see the dead box motif spelt out, D-E-A-D. -E and the first thing to note is that the T4 bacteriophage is idiosyncratic. It doesn't have the A, it has an F. Now, let's move over to the heat map in the middle here. And what this heat map is showing you is a sequence that corresponds to this dead box region, D, E, F, D, R, S, G, L, A, E, as is written along the horizontal axis. And at each position with the saturation mutagenesis experiment using the bacteriophage platform Subu developed does is to replace that residue with one of the 20 amino acids or stop codon, which is stop codons denoted star. And then for each one of those substitutions, the effect on phage replication is measured using Illumina deep sequencing. And in this diagram, the fitness is shown on a log 10 scale. And what dark blue tells you is that the mutation leads to loss of function. And if it's really dark blue, it, you know, it's like at least 100 fold down. And so when we look at this, we start to see that it, things start to make chemical sense. The D and the E, which are the first two residues, cannot be substituted even by another acidic residue without total loss of function, as measured by phage production. And that makes sense because if you're coordinating magnesium, so if you look over here, if you're coordinating magnesium and activating a water molecule, if you shift the position of the carboxyl group by even a fraction of an angstrom, you lose activity. And the experiment the deep mutagenesis experiment is reflecting that chemical truth. If you move over and look at the fourth position, which is aspartate, you'll see that that's more, slightly more tolerant. The aspartate can be replaced by glutamate in the T4 system. And as I mentioned earlier, that aspartate is not a catalytic residue. It's not involved in positioning anything for catalysis and interacting with an arginine for interfacial stabilization. We'll come back to that and look at it in more detail later, but you can understand that maybe aspen glue would still work. And in fact, if you go down and look over here, cysteine also works. And when you look at this little bit of the heat map uh, showing mutational response, you start to learn things that are very interesting. And I just want to, I'm not going to belabor this much, I just want to tell you why these experiments, show you why these experiments are so interesting to us. So first of all, these are dead box proteins. But T4 doesn't have A, it has phenylalanine in the third position. What this experiment here tells us, and if you draw your eye to the, to the purple box, what it tells us if you, is that if you actually put A into the T4 clamp loader, you get loss of function. So again, it's telling us that this particular protein is idiosyncratic in its sequence it uses. It doesn't, at certain positions, match the consensus. Most interestingly, if you move over and look at this arginine residue, which is identified as arginine 111, you'll see that this arginine residue cannot be replaced by anything, not even lysine. The only thing that works is arginine. And this arginine is forming iron pair, uh, an iron pair with a phosphate backbone of DNA. And it's forming the classic arginine phosphate bidentate hydrogen bonding system that we see in our crystal structure. You can't replace it with anything, not even lysine, because lysine wouldn't do that. But if you look at the sequence logo, which tells you what the population of phage clamp loaders is doing, arginine isn't even seen in the logo at this position. So what that says is that the idiosyncrasies are becoming evident now. Arginine is critical for T4 clamp lower. Most of the phage clamp lowers don't use arginine. They're doing something else. And this is why the deep mutagenesis experiment is actually giving us information that's adding on to the information that the sequence alignment is telling us.
And the rest of the talk will really be trying to understand what's that extra information that it's telling us, at least our initial guesses as to what that extra information is about. So if you look at where the most sensitive residues are, the ones that you really cannot change to maybe more than one or, one or two other residues, you find that these residues, which are colored blue in this diagram, form a belt around the DNA. And this belt is, is very satisfying to look at in detail. It connects each ATP, shown in red, to DNA, shown in the center in black, connects the DNA and the ATP to the sliding clamp, which is shown underneath in a sort of wire diagram. This is a crystal structure done by my group about 10 or Brian Mc, uh, Kelch and Deborah McKino about 10 years ago. And so the most critical residues are where you'd expect them to be. They're, they're leading from the ATP. This thing binds ATP cooperatively to, to the DNA, to the, to the sliding clamp. They integrate all that information, allowing the system to fire ATP hydrolysis only when uh, this is correctly uh, configured. But the really startling thing in this diagram is what's not there. Every single residue in this structure in the sliding clamp, in all subunits of the clamp loader, including the one colored green, were mutated in Cebu's experiment. But they're not colored blue. And what that means is all those residues that are not colored, which is the great majority of the structure, can in fact accept many, many substitutions and still keep working. So what this diagram actually reflects is something we already know from the mutagenesis studies of small proteins. It's reflecting the amazing tolerance of proteins to mutational insult. But it's saying that even for a large system like this, doing something as crucial as replicating the DNA, it can accept single point mutations, some of them quite startlingly different from the wild type sequence, while keeping on working. Now, when we look at the uh, residues that are really sensitive to mutation, we did discover one thing. There was one thing we hadn't noticed in all the years of studying this clamp loader, which is actually its importance evident in the structure, but I just want to point this out to you um, just to uh, finish wrapping up the results of the first round of experiments, and that is that we know the system is highly cooperative when it comes to uh, DNA binding and ATP binding. And so you'd expect, since there are four ATP binding sites, and the ATP is colored red here, you'd expect that the system has allosteric communication that goes from one site to the other, it surely does, and to DNA. But what you'll see in this view is that there's really no conservation of sequence between each ATP site. We now know that that's because Secondary structural elements play a critical role in the communication. It's not something I'm going to talk about today, but we've done experiments to sort of address that. And so you don't really need a specific sequence. There's only one point of conservation, strict, almost strict conservation, connecting the ATP binding sites, and that's a residue called glutamine 118. And that's one we just, because it's not a catalytic residue, we just uh, hadn't noticed its importance before. If you look at what glutamine 118 is doing, it's a glutamine side chain that does what glutamine is so good at doing. Glutamine can mimic, it, it, it's got the capacity to mimic backbone hydrogen bonding in a beta sheet. And so what it's actually doing is it's stapling this purple helix to this yellow helical structure and loop here. And when you see this, you recognize, and we call these three helices, the yellow, magenta, and orange helices, which are found in all Reche type ATPases, we call them the uh, central coupler together because you'll see what's happening here is this is the point where the clamp loader is integrating all the information that it needs to integrate. In red here is the dead box or DEXD buff in this, this particular variant, the aspartate glutamate X aspartate and it's leading into the magenta helix and the glutamine is coupling that magenta helix to this yellow structure which is presenting an arginine called the arginine finger, a term borrowed from the RAS literature. And the arginine finger is pointing to a subunit not shown here. That subunit is the one before this one in the assembly. And the arginine is doing just what the arginine finger of a RAS gap does. It's, it's pointing right at the phosphate center that's going to be hydrolyzed. And it has to be positioned correctly for the subunit before this one to hydrolyze ATP. So this structure here is coupling the arginine finger to the dead box. And, and, and the magenta helix is also touching DNA. 
And the orange helix is touching both the clamp and the DNA. So it's integrating everything, and that's what the uh, glutamine 118 is doing. Now, I could tell you more about glutamine 118, but in the interest of presenting new information that isn't yet uh, stuff that we've solidified and published, I'm going to move on. But first, I'm just going to say that the power of this platform is such that Subu could ask a very simple question. What would happen if you mutated glutamine 118 and then did a saturation mutagenesis screen that brought back function? Could you do that? And how quickly would you, could you get function back in just one mutation? And the answer is you could. So what this diagram shows you is the result of a deep mutagenesis screen in, glutamine, in which glutamine 118 was fixed to asparagine. It's a sort of conservative substitution is the one that least damages. All mutations to glutamine 118 are damaging, but the asparagine is the least damaging. And what this diagram shows you are the results of two experiments, two saturation mutagenesis experiments that were conducted independently. So you just have fitness on the x and y axis on a log 10 scale. So zero means that the system has the fitness of the original Q118N mutant. N negative numbers mean that the additional mutations just kill the clamp loader. And positive numbers mean that you actually got back activity. And so three would mean you got a thousand-fold times more activity than the Q118N. And so in fact, what's shown here is a single mutation, Q118N, glycine 143N, that brings back activity in two independent trials. Glycine 143N is a, a residue that's very interesting because it's not actually interesting in the original saturation mutagenesis experiment. So first of all, what it does, gly this glycine residue 143 is located close to where glutamine 118 is in the, in the structure. So glutamine 118 is removed or it's replaced by asparagine, which changes its ability to hydrogen bond. And what the system does is respond by putting back an asparagine, which has hydrogen bonding capacity right next to it. But what's interesting is to look at where this residue is and what it's doing. So first of all, glycine 143, and this is a residue that'll come back in things that I'm, I'm uh, going to be discussing. Glycine 143 is not uh, at a site of conservation or at a site of mutational sensitivity, which makes sense because if you've damaged the system by making a, a mutation that causes loss of function, the response will probably come easier from a system where you know, the system is tolerant. So that's one thing. So it's at a mutationally tolerant site. The second thing is it's an idiosyncratic site. By that I mean the T4 clamp loader has glycine there. But the population tends to have lysine or arginine. And that makes sense because if you see where that 143 position is, it's right next to DNA. So you can start to see, I showed you earlier an arginine that's critical in the T4 clamp loader, which in this clamp loader, at another position, there isn't an arginine or lysine. It's, for some reason, glycine. And so you can see how the system is idiosyncratic in recognition of DNA. And that's where it gets back the capacity to repair a function. So we were curious about this capacity to repair function. And I want to now turn our attention to this subunit in the T4 clamp loader, which we call the CLASP. It's just it's a subunit that's also found in the RFC complex and eukaryotes. And if you look at this crystal structure, you would say, I would say as a structural biologist, that it's the most important subunit in the clamp loader, even though it's not an ATPA subunit. So look at what it's doing. It's, it's actually connecting to both sides of the clamp. So it's open the sliding clamp, the structure, the sliding clamp in gray is open, and it's touching both sides of the open sliding clamp. It's touching the primer template junction. And in fact, it specifically recognizes the primer template junction. Without going into detail, it's doing something that all helicases do. It's using a hydrophobic residue to wedge in between the strands of DNA and sort of recognize the fact that the template has ended and a primer is coming out. So it's very, very important structurally. And so it's a disappointment or a shock to look at the results of the saturation mutagenesis shown here as a heat map and see that, in fact, it's not mutationally sensitive. What this histogram uh, does is show you the distribution of fitness effects for every single point mutation on this log 10 scale. And you'll see basically most mutations don't do anything, even the most disturbing ones are probably not very disturbing. 
So that goes counter to the idea that this green subunit is so structurally central and so important. And it, it sort of says, whoa, uh, is it that we can't read um, you know, what the structure is telling us? So now we wondered what would happen if we took the clamp loader, which is running under ideal conditions in E. coli with lots of Luria broth and you know, everything is happy. And what would, what would happen if we tipped it off balance? And what Subu did was to make a chimeric clamp loader. So this is here in purple are the subunits of the uh, wild type T4 clamp loader. The, all these purple subunits are encoded by one gene. And so there are four copies of that gene. So there are four ATPase, AAA plus ATPase subunits generated. Now there are a whole bunch of other AAA plus proteins you could consider or just clamp loaders. And so here are different clamp loaders. There's some eukaryotic ones, some bacteriophage ones. And so what he did was to create chimeric clamp loaders in which he swapped in a AAA plus module from another clamp loader. And so this is an example of a chimeric clamp loader where the AAA plus unit now comes from another clamp loader. But the so-called collar domains, which are part of the, um, each subunit that oligomerize, are from T4. And the green clasp subunit is from T4. And the sliding clamp is from T4. Now, what happens is that if you, is, is that if you swap in eukaryotic clamp loaders that, that are quite sequence divergent, you get complete loss of function. By that I mean so we can't recover any phage. And if you can't recover enough phage to sequence, you sort of don't know what's going on. But for this particular phage called RR2, when he swaps that in, it's 64 identi percent identical in sequence to T4. It's very similar. When he swaps that in, he gets a 4,000-fold reduction, which seems like a lot, but it's actually enough uh, to purify phage. And actually doing a second round of competition, he's actually able to grow up the winners and sequence them. And when he sequences then the things that emerge, so he's now going to mutate the green subunit. So in other words, the chimera is he's replaced the ATPA subunits with, with something coming from a foreign clamp loader. The system is now really hobbled, but he makes mutations in the clasp subunit and then asks, how quickly does the system recover? And the great thing is that it recovers very quickly. But before I show you how much it recovers, let's focus on this diagram here, which is a small part of the fitness map of single site saturation mutagenesis, that is all possible mutations, in this clasp subunit, it's just a small part of the clasp subunit. And what I want to show you now is the deep blue. And this is extremely gratifying because if you go and analyze the deep blue, you'll see that it makes sense. So our structures were in fact telling us what the points of sensitivity are. I'll just point out, for example, these two residues that are deep blue here are exactly where the clasp subunit touches the sliding clamp. So in fact, the sensitivity can now be understood in terms of the structural details that we know from the crystal structure. But you can also see that now the system has red in several places. And if you look at the distribution of fitness over the whole green uh, subunit, it goes from this very narrow, uh, essentially tolerant distribution to a distribution that shows substantial loss of function, but also gain of function in many places. And you can now interpret the gain of function, and I'm just going to show you uh, one uh, example. So this is now looking at the uh, clamp loader, and in green is this clasp subunit. Here's DNA. And here are two residues, glutamine 26 and 323. And glutamine 26 is touching the phosphate backbone of DNA in our crystal structure. 323 doesn't touch the phosphate backbone, but if but it almost could. And if you replace this glutamine by arginine, or this threonine by arginine, or lysine, that's shown here, you get a tenfold increase in activity if you, in the background of the chimeric clamp loader. And if you combine them, Subu gets a hundredfold increase in activity. So what we learn from this is that there's an untapped capacity for optimization built into the system so that it's really able to respond very quickly. By quickly, I mean a single point mutation starts waking you up. And the reason this happens, if we think about it, is obvious that, the, that, that any system drifts away through neutral mutational drift from 
the highly optimized system, when it's you know, operating and it's redundant in its functions, and you don't see the capacity for restoration of function unless you stress the system. So that's what we want to learn from this. Now I want to end by moving back to the dead box and showing you uh, the, what we learned that was uh, interesting and surprising for us from uh, the studies of the dead box. So I've explained what the dead box does, and I want to turn now to this last aspartate in the dead box, which I said coordinates an interfacial residue. It's arginine one oh, uh, sorry, arginine one twenty two coming from a neighboring uh, uh, domain. The dead box, as I said, is found in RNA helicases. That's where that's where they were first uh, defined, and from the years of work done in RNA helicases, we know that what this aspartate is doing is coupling RNA recognition to ATP hydrolysis. So we infer that that must be what it's doing in the clamp loader as well. And here's a diagram taken from a picture uh, in, uh, or taken from a paper published by Alan Lambowitz and colleagues in Nature about 10 years ago. And it's uh, explaining how a dead box helicase works. These are so-called monomeric helicases, but but, they, but the way to really think about them is that they're two ATPase units that are linked on the same protein chain. So they're like two adjacent clamp loader subunits. And so in this diagram from the Lambowitz paper, you can see that ATP is bound and RNA is bound. And only when both are bound is an active site configured properly, which will trigger ATP hydrolysis. And critical to the formation of the active site is an is a iron pair formed between the last D of the dead box motif and an arginine presented by the same helical assembly that I'd been focusing on in the clamp loader. So this is you know, what the uh, last D of the dead box is doing. So we asked, what would happen if we mutated the D and then asked how, oh, somebody closed the clock that was there that I was keeping my eye on. Oh, yeah, please put that back because, um, are you, have you given me 10 more minutes or what did you do? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think the time is accurate. You don't need to adjust it. It's 3.38 by my watch on that clock, but it's easier to watch the clock so that I can end and let everybody go without resentment and anger. So don't put that away. So, um, you know, uh, so we wanted to ask what would happen if you mutate the, the aspartate, the last, last aspartate, and see how quickly things come back. And so what somebody told me is that you cannot wake the dead, but you can wake the Walking Dead. And so what Kendra Marcus, who is uh, asking this question, did was to try to identify a mutation in the aspartate that would be the Walking Dead. And I'd already pointed this out to you. If you change aspartate 110 in the dead box to cysteine, you get loss of function, but it's not uh, you know, a really dreadful loss of function. And if you think about it a little bit, you can see that the reason this is the case is that the aspartate can deprotonate, I'm sorry, the cysteine can deprotonate, then you'll get S minus, and the S minus is a mimic for aspartate. And in fact, Kendra did the crystal structure of the uh, aspartate to cysteine mutant clamp loader complex bound to DNA. I'm not going to show you that. And, and from looking at how that cysteine coordinates the arginine, we're pretty sure that's what's happening. So this is the walking dead. It's taken a hit in activity, but you know, we can ask how quickly does it recover. So now that mutation is fixed, and then Kendra mutates um, everything else using this assay. So first of all, just to show you it really is the walking dead, what this graph is showing us is, is time, it's an ATPS assay, time on the x-axis, and ATP hydrolysis on the y-axis. And if you add the clamp loader and DNA together, you get no ATP hydrolysis. You need to add the clamp loader and DNA and the clamp, all three of the things, and then for the wild type you get rapid ATP hydrolysis. ATP hydrolysis is only one small window on the full function of the clamp loader, but it's a useful one. And if you make the aspartate 110 to C mutation, you'll see that it's the walking dead. It's not dead, it's not completely active, and it's intermediate. So now we will fix that mutation and look at how the system responds. And the result of this was actually so disappointing, it, it held all of us who were working and thinking about this 
back, um, where I would say a year, which is shown in this diagram, which is that these red uh, spheres or surfaces show you the sites where there are single point mutations that wake up the walking dead, meaning D110C. The major conclusion you can draw from looking at this diagram is that these sites of rescue mutations all occur uh, in regions that are tolerant to mutation in the original clamp loader. So that's nice, that's gratifying, but it's not very exciting. And what's particularly frustrating about this, uh, these results is that you, we've, we've spent months staring at them and we just can't understand what these mutations are doing. They just make no sense to me. So one out here is to say, well, there's no direct relationship between structure and the free energy landscape on which the protein operates, and so these are just changing the free energy landscape. But I found that unsatisfactory because I know that's true, but I'd still like to understand how these mutations are affecting um, you know, the function. And they really do, the ones that Kendra has purified and tested really do affect the function, as we show you here. So here, let's look at this ATPase uh, activity graph first. So again, this is time versus ATP hydrolysis. And uh, the wild type is in blue, uh, in black, and when you add DNA and the clamp and ATP, it hydrolyzes ATP. In yellow is D110C, which I call the walking dead, which has an attenuated ATP activity, ATPase activity. But if you make a single point mutation, it's one of those red residues, D110C plus proline 50 to lysine, you've woken up the, the walking dead. In this ATPase assay, it comes back uh, to wild type ATPase activity. This graph above is a little harder, the, the, the mutational um, fitness is a little harder for you to take in, but I'm just gonna show you a couple of things. First, it's just showing you the log, uh, you know, the fitness of variants. And in the background of D110C compared to the completely wild type clamp loader. So this is proline 50. And so proline 50, when it's proline, that means the only mutation is D110C, it's light blue, which means it's taken a loss of function. That's the D110C function, in other words. White would be wild type. Total wild type protein without the D110C is zero or white in this scale. And so what that means is that if you change proline 50 to lysine according to this experiment, you actually, not only do you wake up the walking dead, you're actually now, the walking dead has woken up and is running a marathon. It's actually a better clamp loader than the fully wild type. And we can sort of rationalize this. This is the one thing I've been able to rationalize a little bit. This is the site of proline 50. It's in the so-called famous P loop, because here's the phosphate. It's the phosphate binding loop. Here's the proline. And uh, this proline, which is also a tolerant site of tolerant idiosyncratic substitution, is right next to a glutamate. So you can sort of see why making it a lysine might give you back activity, but it's very unsatisfactory because arginine doesn't work. But the key to understanding what all of these mutations are doing is to look at this diagram and actually appreciate that many, many, many substitutions are better than the original wild type. That is, in the D110C background, proline, isn't, proline to lysine isn't the only substitution that's waking up the walking dead. You can acquire activity towards original wild type by changing proline to many things. So it can't just be this iron pair. And this was the key that let me begin to understand what these rescue mutations are doing. And I understood what they're doing because most of my lab actually works on signaling proteins like RAS and EGF receptor and the Abelson kinase. And we study rescue mutations all the time because they manifest as patient resistance mutations to drugs. And basically, this is the signature of an inhibitory interaction that's being broken by the mutation, allowing the protein to escape from that auto-inhibition and then regain activity that the damage done by D110C uh, had caused it to incur. And this lets us use a principle that we use when understanding kinases and RAS uh, and things like that, which oh, I just want to show you that if you look at the whole heat map, uh, you'll see, uh, just look at the lower graph, uh, like here, um, 
you, you'll see that many mutations wake the walking dead. I, I don't want to walk through this whole complicated diagram. And, I, and the principle we use to understand a lot of resistance mutations I call the Anna Karenina principle because I've neither read Anna Karenina nor have I read anything else by Tolstoy, but I, I read a review by Louise Johnson who is a foundational structural biologist and inspiration to many of us who died some years ago before her time. And in her obituary uh, published by the Royal Society, they say, the writer says that she would bring protein structures to life by, by making them populate characters in a novel. And in this case, she's quoting Leo Tolstoy from Anna Karenina to say, happy families are all alike. Unha every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And the principle here is that when you have an enzyme system, the catalytic center has to be conserved in the happy state, which is the on state, because it has to obey the dictates of chemistry. But if evolution wants to regulate that enzyme, all that evolution has to do to create an auto-inhibited state that's off is to do something that makes the enzyme unhappy. And the way evolution will do that for a divergent set of proteins will be unique for every divergent protein or every subclass. And we see that in kinases. That's a lecture for another day. And so we started thinking about the Anna Karenina principle. And that told us we're missing a structure. That's why we don't understand the mutations. The structure we're missing is an off state of the clamp loader. And today, we have the power of cryo-EM that we can deploy to answer a question like this. With crystallography, we could barely obtain the crystal structures that, we've sh that I've shown you because, um, I've shown you glimpses of, because the, the clamp layer is so difficult to crystallize. We definitely had no view of the inactive structure for the T4 system, and we couldn't use whatever people had guessed about inactive structures for other systems to understand these mutations. So fortunately, Youngjan Huan, under the guidance of Sriram Subramanim, who used to be here at the NIH, uh, started applying uh, cryo-EM uh, to determine structures of uncross-linked clamp loaders, so really as close to the native state as we can. And the first result shown here is the structure of the happy state of the clamp loader. It's bound to DNA, it's bound to an ATP analog, it's bound to the clamp. And it looks just like the crystal structure we published um, more than 10 years ago. So that's a relief for us. We don't have to rewrite any, uh, uh, any of our conclusions. But he was also able very quickly to determine structures where one or the other thing is missing so that the system is unhappy. And whenever he does that, he gets the same structure back. When he omits DNA, when he omits the clamp, when he uses ADP, when he puts the D110C mutation in, he gets the structure on the right. And this is an unhappy structure. In fact, it's a structure that's very stable. It doesn't need the clamp, although the clamp is shown here. And it's in a configuration where it can't bind DNA. And to show you that, here's an animation uh, interpolation between the off state or the unhappy state and the active state. And it's actually fascinating to look at this. You'll see like helices unwinding. And, and the real point I wanted to make from this is that there must be an energy cost to going from the inactive state to the active state. That energy cost is paid by DNA, but it's also paid by the arginine aspartate interaction involving the dead box. And so presumably what's happening is these mutations are lowering that energy cost. And what's really exciting, and I want to show you this, is that if we go in and look at the structural changes happening inside one of the ATPases, of course, these global changes are also important, but if we look at one of the structural changes happening inside the ATPase, we can actually start to see things that we appreciate from the studies of RAS, uh, which guide so much thinking in my lab. And to set that up, here's one subunit of the clamp loader in the assembly, in the happy state. And, and here's an ATP analog back here. And here is the terminal phosphate, colored yellow and blue, which happens to be a beryllium fluoride. Here's a residue called asparagine-139 that's attacking the phosphate. Asparagine-139 is equivalent to glutamine-61, which is you know, the site of the three famous cancer mutations in RAS. And what Asparagine-139 is doing is, is the same. It's on switch two, and it's, it's, it's uh, deprotonating a water molecule or activating a water molecule for attacking the phosphate. And this is a configuration 
that's perfectly poised uh, to do that. We've trapped it using uh, ADP beryllium fluoride. And you'll see here are two arginine residues. One of them is the arginine finger I've already told you about. It, it uh, is interacting with the ATP in the subunit before. Here it is. And this is arginine 122, which is interacting with the aspartate of the dead box in the previous subunit. So it's all set up. And if you go through this subunit, there's another arginine in the AAA pluses called sensor 2. And it's interacting with the phosphate, but it's now setting up the interaction with the next ATP. So this is the structure we understand. Now, if you now look at an interpolation between the off state derived from the 3.2 angstrom cryo-EM structure of young Jan, you start to see all these, to those of us who study these ATPases and GTPases, really marvelous changes. So for example, here, that's the happy state, but you see asparagine 139 pulled away. It's pulled away because in the off state, there are no flanking interactions. They're all broken in the off state. And so this is really off because the catalytic residue has been pulled out. And the other things you could look at, here's glutamine 118 residue I'd spent a lot of time discussing earlier. But suddenly what you see is that these rescue mutations, and here are the most important ones shown as red spheres, are in regions where the structure is changing. So I don't know what they're doing through the energetics, but now I finally see that they're located in sites where the structure changes between off and on. So all they have to do is alter that energetic balance or the landscape or the barrier, and we can understand why they cause the walking dead uh, to wake up. So with that, I'll end. What we've learned from our studies is that there is, of course, resident in each of these proteins an enormous capacity for sequence change. And we're studying the sequence change while the phage is replicating, the ability to withstand sequence change while the phage is replicating DNA. So that's really the most important function. Hydrogen bonded secondary structure elements maintain coupling across interfaces, and I didn't discuss that today. And I introduced the Anna Karenina principle. And that means that each system is optimizing the balance between on and off, but it's doing so differently because the off states can be different. And so I think the, the structures change, and as they change, they're moving along different evolutionary trajectories. And it's part of what has enabled, of course, many things has enabled the diversity of uh, these structures, which I've shown you three here, clamp loader, clipex on full days, and ATP synthase, which are using the same, essentially the same analogous elements to control their action. So with that, I'll end, and once again, thank Subhu Subramaniam, Kendra Marcus, Kent Gorday, Young Jan Huang, and Christine Gi for being instrumental in uh, letting this work uh, uh, take place and be done. So thank you. Um, thank you for the great talk. I was curious, in your rescue experiment with the D110C, uh, do you ever have double mutations, for example, that rescue even more efficiently than the single mutations, or it's always? Yeah, so the question is, um, with the D110C, have we studied double mutations? And uh, so the simple answer is no, because the way the experiment was done was to only introduce um, one mutation at a time. So if you, uh, I alluded to the fact that in the rescue of the so-called CLASP subunit, Subu did find that he could combine two of the mutations, give additional. Um, so, uh, you know, as you can imagine, the diversity of possible sequences explodes when you start combining mutations. So one of the things that we're probably going to do is not sit and combine these mutations, but use various methods for generating alternative sequences that are vastly, you know, not combining just two mutations, but you know, mixing up lots of things. And then, because this is a high throughput experiment, we can test thousands of variants in an experiment, and from that, glean something about coupling between residues. Thank you. Thank you. So, John, thanks for a for a phenomenal talk. Um, so, I was wondering about uh, sort of two things. One is. I'm thinking about the work that Rama Ranganathan has done in terms of the statistical coupling analysis. Oh, I, I, sorry, I just want to interrupt uh, because uh, you, you mentioned Rama Ranganathan, and I should really have put him on the slide because he's r responsible for transferring. I mean, he's, he's the person who taught my lab how to do these experiments, and Subhu Subramaniam is in the 
upper left-hand corner here was a graduate student with Rama Ramananda. Ah, I see. So we really owe Rama um, for his intellectual leadership uh, in getting us to this point. Right. So I imagine that the in your in the first part, the the conserved cluster that you showed that would probably come out of a statistical coupling analysis. Yes. I'm curious, these other the last patch of the, the scattered residues that you showed, would they also show up in an SEM? No, they, they would not. They would not. And your question is a great one because it lets me further expand on what I think is conceptually the importance of what I call the Anna Karenina principle. So all happy families have to be happy in the same way. And so when you do a sequence conservation of, of, a, of a large family, ah. uh, the sequence conservation is going to reflect the happiness state. <laughs> Right? And so you right. see the blue belt, which is really coupling catalysis. Mm -hmm. right. Now you use the Anna Karenina principle, and you learn that each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And I refer to that as idiosyncrasy in the, in mm -hmm. the, in the sequences. So that will not come out of sequence conservation. But of course, what will happen is that if you have a large enough sequence database, sub-families will be unhappy in the same way. And an example from signaling, and this is why you know our work on signaling is really what let us jump to this conclusion, is to consider the kind of, and I'm just going to say this because you know signaling is really what most of the lab does. Um, the kinases that have SH2, SH3, and kinase are an ancient family of signaling kinases. But the sub-members of this, the SARC kinases, the ABL kinase, the BTK kinase, have really different ways in which they use the SH2 and SH3 domains to switch off the kinase. So they're unhappy in different mm -hmm. ways. But of course, if you go into the SARC kinase lineage, you'll figure out what keeps the SARC kinases unhappy, because that's conserved within the subfamily. I had a second question, which is that this is about the glycine that you know basically gets mutated to uh, uh, sort of uh, then rescue the, the first mutation. This is in the first part of your talk. Um, uh, so my question is that if you constrain that, if you, if you now do an experiment where you don't, that, you don't let the glycine make uh, a change into the, I think it was changing into a glutamine, do you, have you done experiments like that now? You, so essentially, it's to what extent can it, can it actually recover if you, if you start constraining two residues? Well, we, I don't know if I make my question clear. We, 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 we haven't done the experiment quite the way you're saying, but we know first from uh, just the natural sequence variation is that there are proteins that don't use that glutamine and don't, you know, so nature is, is very diverse in coming up with solutions. And the second thing I'd say is that we can, of course, think, as I said earlier, of combining this with that with this, but uh, we haven't quite gotten going with those. Thank you. Just because the combinations are so um, large, yeah. Okay, so um, from online, uh, Tom Schneider asks, how much ATP is used per step, or removal, question mark, of the clamp loader? Yes, uh, I'm asked, you know, how much ATP is, is used in the cycle. Uh, work, not our work, but Mike O'Donnell has suggested uh, in papers. That's a difficult question to answer because what you end up doing is making mutations. And so you can, the answer is that you can get a functioning clamp loader if only one ATP is hydrolyzed. It's sort of hobbling along. Okay. Any more questions? One more coming down? Oh, there's somebody coming down here or there. Yeah. No, please. Uh, oh. You're bringing about the glycine uh, mutation there. Uh, you know, the, it's not only the mutation side chains, but it's also the, the, muta the vibrations. Uh, and the motion of this. The glycine definitely is basically allowing it to be more flexible than the other. Yes, of course, the glycine w introduces mm. flexibility, which is removed by the mutation that rescues. And uh, <laughs> you know the dynamics could well be an important Very component important. of the. And the final one question, also, T4 phase DNA is glucosylated. And uh, do you uh, consider Yeah, so the, the T4 DNA is glucosylated, and that's one of the things that the phage machinery does after it infects the phage, and actually that's the reason we had to put in a CRISPR system, because that prevents us, you see the phage infects the E. coli, then I didn't get asked the question, why don't we just sequence, you know, the phage that are, you know, why don't we just sequence um, 
the E. coli that's left or something like that. But the thing is, the phage comes in and so damages the DNA, the host DNA. Okay. And that's the reason we put in the CRISPR system to get the phage out. So okay. I fully appreciate that, yeah. Um, a question about the first part of the talk. Um, when you did the first mutational analysis, some of the mutants actually enhanced the properties, the, the replication of the, of the T4, right? So that means that nature, if evolution you know, went on longer, could actually find more efficient T4s that could, in fact, equal even more efficiently. Yes, I mean, nature could find more efficient T4, which is surely the case because we're so quickly able to change the function after a mutation. So that leads into difficult questions of um, what is actually the conditional spectrum you know, under which the phage is actually being selected. Right, and, so and, and one of them was the, the finale residue in the DEXD motif to a histidine seemed to be more efficient. Yeah, we haven't made that, that's very intriguing. Like why would that, <laughs> why would that work better than wild type? So we don't know. Um, the, we should make that, but you know, I'm, maybe I'm trying to communicate the sense that these data are rich and can be exploited in many ways. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think with that, uh, let's uh, thank John for a really, really intriguing and engaging talk. Thank you all.